بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, Good morning uh, Latham and Watkins is honored to sponsor a Tumuh event for the third time and I'm particularly enthusiastic about this event uh, Not only is it, as Farah said, a more intimate event which will give us an opportunity for meaningful engagement but we also have the privilege of being at one of the world's oldest and most prestigious universities um, I took a walk uh, around uh, the, the town this morning and I was really awestruck by the realization that some of the world's greatest thinkers spent their formative years here. Uh, people like John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, Adam Smith, Albert Einstein, dozens of Nobel laureates, and other great minds. This is a place for thinking. This is a place for reflecting on the past, and this is a place for anticipating the future. I personally cannot think of a better place to hold this retreat. So what do we want to accomplish during the next two days? I genuinely don't know, and I think that's OK. <laughs> the most members tend to be type A personalities, the type of people that like to make checklists and to-do lists, the type of people that like to write down their goals and know what they want for every situation. If that's who you are, I think that's great. Then you probably already have a list of objectives for this retreat. I don't. And I'm here to tell those of you who are like me that sometimes it's okay to walk into a room without knowing where the exit is. It's okay not to have everything planned. While I don't know what we should try to accomplish over the next two days, I do have some thoughts on how we should approach the next two days to maximize uh, the two days that we have here. In my mind, we have to do three things. We need to stop, we need to reflect, i.e. look back, and we need to anticipate, i.e. look to the future. Stop, reflect, anticipate. Let's take each one of those in turn. First, stop. Each one of us is inundated on a daily basis with noise and static. We get hundreds of emails, text messages, WhatsApp messages, phone calls, social media messages and alerts, news alerts, you name it. It's hard to think when your day, when our day is full of distractions and interruptions. In fact, a common refrain when I talk to my colleagues is that they tell me something to the effect of, I worked 14 hours today and I got nothing done. There are just too many distractions. Rudyard Kipling famously advised in one of his most well-known poems to fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds of distance run. But in this day and age, it seems like we spend 40 of those 60 seconds running in place because there are just too many distractions. So please, stop. Let's tune out, so please just stop. Let's tune out the external distractions. Let's put our phones on silent, or better yet, turn them off. Also, let's stop and tune out the internal distractions. Those lingering thoughts in the back of our heads about the minutia that may keep us from fully engaging and getting the most out of this retreat. After we manage to stop, we need to reflect. We need to think about the choices we made or that were made for us the choices that got us to where we are today. Too often when we spend time thinking about our own personal past, we spend it either reminiscing or regretting. We don't spend enough time reflecting. We don't spend enough time critically thinking about why choices were made and how they got us to this point in our lives. When I reflect on my own life, I can identify about a dozen inflection points where either because of external forces or my own choices, my life pivoted in one direction or another. One such inflection point for me happened in 1999. And looking out at the audience, some people may be too young to remember 1999, but I remember it vividly. And, and some of us, a lot of others do remember it vividly as well. Um, I just finished my third year of university at Lafayette College in Pennsylvania. And the economy at the time was in the midst of an unprecedented stock market boom, the dot-com boom. Every one of my class, classmates wanted to become a trader on Wall Street and make millions. So did I. In fact, one of my friends who graduated a year before had just gotten a job on a trading desk. And, his, and in his first few months of working there, he told me that he had made $5 million for his firm and earned a $250,000 bonus. Those numbers were unimaginable for a recent college graduate, and I think they still are. My future was set. The market would keep booming, and I would ride the wave. But of course it didn't, because nothing lasts forever. The dot-com boom turned out to be a bubble. And in early 2000, the dot-com bubble burst. My friend had squandered away his entire bonus, 
got laid off and had to get a job as an intern making less than $20,000 a year. My plan to be a trader evaporated. I quickly scrambled to find a plan B. My father at the time told me to consider applying to law school. I took the law school entry exam, the LSATs, and applied to whichever law school I could find that accepted applications that late in the year. The next year I went to law school and my career in law began. The circumstances forced me to pivot. When I reflect back on that moment, I have to smile at how a decision that at the time I felt I got cornered into ended up being one of the best choices of my life. We also need to reflect on a macro level, not just reflect on the personal past. History has a funny way of repeating itself, and understanding why things happened the way they did in the past will help us anticipate the future. After we manage to stop, after we manage to reflect, we need to anticipate. We live in a world of radical change. Technological innovation has altered every aspect of our lives. Our climate is changing, the world economy is changing, the way that nations are interacting with each other is changing. Values are changing. In my own country, in Saudi Arabia, women are now driving and have become a vital presence in the workforce. In fact, in my own office, there are more female professionals than there are male professionals. Also in Saudi, younger people are in decision-making positions. Our world is changing and how we anticipate and navigate these changes has become more important than ever. My great uncle, Muhammad bin Ahmed Stiri, is a well-known Saudi Arabian poet. And he has one poem that I always go back to for inspiration and wisdom. Um, if the non-Arabic speakers in the room will indulge me, uh, just for a minute, I'm going to switch, switch over to Arabic. وإن كانهم شرحوا على طيب الأفعال حنا وردنا جمامها ورتوينا وفتار القصيدة بيتين من أروع ما كتب في الشعر النبطي يقول الشاعر الله يرحمه بفعالنا نرسم دروب للأجيال إلى نساها غيرنا ما نسينا أسود سادات نتسجل للأشبال فضايل شمنا لها واهتدينا بكرر الشطر الأول مرة ثانية وبيكم تركزون عليه بفعالنا نرسم دروب للأجيال بفعالنا نرسم دروب للأجيال Switching back to English, I want to translate for you one line in the poem. With our actions, we draw paths for generations. With our actions, we draw paths for generations. In a world of misinformation and alternate facts, words mean less than they ever did before. And actions mean everything. We have an opportunity to influence the future. We have an opportunity to draw paths for future generations with the actions that we take today. Anticipating where the world is going is key in order for us to determine what actions we need to take. So in conclusion, I still don't know what our goals are for this retreat, and I still don't care. I just hope that each of us can use these two days to stop for a little bit in order to give ourselves space to think, to spend some time reflecting on our journeys, and critically think about the decisions that got us to this point and to anticipate future changes and how we can take actions to influence the world we live in and become role models for those that come after us. Thank you.